Leviathan, or the matter, for me and power of a commonwealth, ecclesiastical and civil. Book by Thomas Hobbes. Narrated by Andrew. Originally published in 1651. This is a great audiobook production, created for research, study, and discussion purposes. Chapter 30. Of the Office of the Sovereign Representative. The Procuration of the Good of the People. The office of the sovereign, be it a monarch or an assembly, consisteth in the end, for which he was trusted with the sovereign power, namely the procuration of the safety of the people, to which he is obliged by the law of nature, and to render an account thereof to God, the author of that law, and to none but him. But by safety here is not meant a bare preservation, but also all other contentments of life, which every man by lawful industry, without danger or hurt to the commonwealth shall acquire to himself, by instruction and loss. And this is intended should be done, not by care applied to individuals, further than their protection from injuries, when they shall complain. But by a general providence, contained in public instruction, both of doctrine and example. And in the making and executing of good laws, to which individual persons may apply their own cases, against the duty of a sovereign to relinquish any essential right of sovereignty, or not to see the people top the grounds of them. And because, if the essential rights of sovereignty, specified before in the 18th chapter, be taken away, the commonwealth is thereby dissolved, and every man returneth into the condition. And calamity of a war with every other man, which is the greatest evil that can happen in this life winky face it is the office of the sovereign, to maintain those rights entire. And consequently against his duty, first, to transfer to another, or to lay from himself any of them. For he that deserteth the means, deserteth the ends, and he deserteth the means, that being the sovereign, acknowledgeth himself subject to the civil laws, and renounceth the power of supreme judicature, or of making war, or peace by his own authority, or of judging of the necessities of the commonwealth, or of levying money and soldiers, when, and as much as in his own conscience he shall judge necessary, or of making officers, and ministers both of war and peace, or of appointing teachers and examining what doctrines are conformable or contrary to the defense, peace, and good of the people. Secondly, it is against his duty to let the people be ignorant or misinformed of the grounds and reasons of those his essential rights, because thereby men are easy to be seduced and drawn to resist him when the commonwealth shall require their use and exercise. And the grounds of these rights have the rather need to be diligently and truly taught, because they cannot be maintained by any civil law or terror of legal punishment. For a civil law that shall forbid rebellion, and such as all resistance to the essential rights of sovereignty, is not, as a civil law, any obligation, but by virtue only of the law of nature. That forbiddeth the violation of faith, which natural obligation if men know not, they cannot know the right of any law the sovereign mocketh. And for the punishment, they take it but for an act of hostility, which when they think they have strength enough, they will endeavor by acts of hostility to avoid. Objection of those that say there are no principles of reason for absolute sovereignty. As I have heard some say, that justice is but a word, without substance. And that whatsoever a man can by force or art acquire to himself, not only in the condition of war, but also in a commonwealth, is his own, which I have already shewed to be false. So there be also that maintain, that there are no grounds, nor principles of reason, to sustain those essential rights, which make sovereignty absolute. For if there were, they would have been found out in some place, or other, whereas we see, there has not hitherto been any commonwealth, where those rights have been acknowledged, or challenged. Wherein they argue is ill, as if the savage people of America, should deny there were any grounds, or principles of reason, so to build a house, as to last as long as the materials. Because they never yet saw any so well built. Time, and industry, produce every day new knowledge. And as the art of well building, is derived from principles of reason, observed by industrious men, that had long studied the nature of materials, and the diverse effects of figure, and proportion. Long after mankind began, though poorly, to build. So, long time after men have begun to constitute commonwealths, imperfect, and apt to relapse into disorder, there may, principles of reason be found out, by industrious meditation. To make use of them, or be neglected by them, 
or not, concerneth my particular interest, at this day, very little. But supposing that these of mine are not such principles of reason, yet I am sure they are principles from authority of Scripture. As I shall make it appear, when I shall come to speak of the kingdom of God, administered by Moses, over the Jews, his peculiar people by covenant. Objection from the incapacity of the vulgar. But they say again, that though the principles be right, yet common people are not of capacity enough to be made to understand them. I should be glad, that the rich, and potent subjects of a kingdom, or those that are accounted the most learned, were no less incapable than they. But all men know, that the obstructions to this kind of doctrine, proceed not so much from the difficulty of the matter, as from the interest of them that are to learn. Potent men, digest hardly anything that setteth up a power to bridle their affections. And learned men, anything that discovereth their errors, and thereby lesseneth their authority. Whereas the common people's minds, unless they be tainted with dependence on the potent, or scribbled over with the opinions of their doctors, are like clean paper. Fit to receive whatsoever by public authority shall be imprinted in them. Shall whole nations be brought to acquiesce in the great mysteries of Christian religion, which are above reason. And millions of men be made believe, that the same body may be in innumerable places, at one and the same time, which is against reason. And shall not men be able, by their teaching and preaching, protected by the law, to make that received, which is so consonant to reason, that any unprejudicated man needs no more to learn it than to hear it? I conclude, therefore, that in the instruction of the people in the essential rights, which are the natural and fundamental laws of sovereignty, there is no difficulty. Whilst a sovereign has his power entire, but what proceeds from his own fault, or the fault of those whom he trusteth in the administration of the commonwealth? And consequently, it is his duty to cause them so to be instructed. And not only his duty, but his benefit also, and security, against the danger that may arrive to himself in his natural person, from rebellion. Subjects are to be taught, not to affect change of government. And, to descend to particulars, the people are to be taught, first, that they ought not to be in love with any for me of government they see in their neighbor nations more than with their own. Nor, whatsoever present prosperity they behold in nations that are otherwise governed than they, to desire change. For the prosperity of a people ruled by an aristocratic hall or democratic hall assembly, cometh not from aristocracy, nor from democracy, but from the obedience and concord of the subjects. Nor do the people flourish in a monarchy, because one man has the right to rule them, but because they obey him. Take away in any kind of state, the obedience, and consequently the concord of the people, and they shall not only not flourish, but in short time be dissolved. And they that go about by disobedience, to do no more than reform the commonwealth, shall find they do thereby destroy it, like the foolish daughters of Peleus in the fable. Which desiring to renew the youth of their decrepit father, did by the counsel of Medea, cut him in pieces, and boil him, together with strange herbs, but made not of him a new man. This desire of change is like the breach of the first of God's commandments, for their God says, Non habibus deos alienos, thou shalt not have the gods of other nations. And in another place concerning kings, that they are gods. Nor adhere, against the sovereign, to popular men. Secondly, they are to be taught, that they ought not to be led with admiration of the virtue of any of their fellow subjects, how high soever he stand. Nor how conspicuously soever he shine in the commonwealth. Nor of any assembly, except the sovereign assembly, so as to defer to them any obedience or honor, appropriate to the sovereign only, whom, in their particular stations, they represent. Nor to receive any influence from them, but such as is conveyed by them from the sovereign authority. For that sovereign cannot be imagined to love his people as he ought, that is not jealous of them, but suffers them by the flattery of popular men, to be seduced from their loyalty. As they have often been, not only secretly, but openly, so as to proclaim marriage with them in facey ecclesi by preachers and by publishing the same in the open streets, which may fitly be compared to the violation of the second of the Ten Commandments, nor to dispute the sovereign power. Thirdly, in consequence to this, they ought to be informed how great fault it is to speak evil of the sovereign representative, whether one man or an assembly of men, or to argue and dispute his power, or any way to use his name irreverently, whereby he may be brought into contempt with his people. 
in their obedience, in which the safety of the commonwealth consisteth slackened, which doctrine the third commandment by resemblance pointeth to, and to have days set apart to learn their duty. Fourthly, seeing people cannot be taught this, nor when tis taught, remember it, nor after one generation past, so much as know in whom the sovereign power is placed. Without setting apart from their ordinary labor, some certain times, in which they may attend those that are appointed to instruct them. It is necessary that some such times be determined, wherein they may assemble together, and, after prayers and praises given to God, the sovereign of sovereigns, hear those their duties told them. And the positive laws, such as generally concern them all, read and expounded, and be put in mind of the authority that mocketh them loss. To this end have the Jews every seventh day, a Sabbath, in which the law was read and expounded, and in the solemnity whereof they were put in mind, that their king was God. That having created the world in six days, he rested the seventh day. And by their resting on it from their labor, that that God was their king, which redeemed them from their servile and painful labor in Egypt, and gave them a time, after they had rejoiced in God, to take joy also in themselves, by lawful recreation. So that the first table of the commandments is spent all in setting down the summy of God's absolute power, not only as God, but as king by pact, in peculiar, of the Jews. And may therefore give light to those that have the sovereign power conferred on them by the consent of men, to see what doctrine they ought to teach their subjects, and to honor their parents. And because the first instruction of children dependeth on the care of their parents, it is necessary that they should be obedient to them, whilst they are under their tuition. And not only so, but that also afterwards, as gratitude requireth, they acknowledge the benefit of their education, by external signs of honor. To which end they are to be taught, that originally the father of every man was also his sovereign lord, with power over him of life and death. And that the fathers of families, when by instituting a commonwealth, they resigned that absolute power, yet it was never intended, they should lose the honor due unto them for their education. For to relinquish such right, was not necessary to the institution of sovereign power. Nor would there be any reason why any man should desire to have children, or take the care to nourish and instruct them, if they were afterwards to have no other benefit from them than from other men. And this accordeth with the fifth commandment, and to avoid doing of injury. Again, every sovereign ought to cause justice to be taught, which consisting in taking from no man what is his, is as much as to say, to cause men to be taught not to deprive their neighbor by violence or fraud of anything which by the sovereign authority is theirs. Of things held in propriety, those that are dearest to a man are his own life and limbs, and in the next degree, in most men, those that concern conjugal affection, and after them riches and means of living. Therefore the people are to be taught to abstain from violence to one another's person by private revenges, from violation of conjugal honor and from forcibly rapine and fraudulent surreption of one another's goods. For which purpose also it is necessary they be shewed the evil consequences of false judgment by corruption either of judges or witnesses, whereby the distinction of propriety is taken away. And justice becomes of no effect, all which things are intimated in the sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth commandments. And to do all this sincerely from the heart. Lastly, they are to be taught that not only the unjust facts, but the designs and intentions to do them, though by accident hind dread, are injustice. Which consisteth in the pravity of the will, as well as in the irregularity of the act. And this is the intention of the tenth commandment in the summit of the second table. Which is reduced all to this one commandment of mutual charity, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, as the summit of the first table is reduced to the love of God. Whom they had then newly received as their king. The use of universities. As for the means and conduits by which the people may receive this instruction, we are to search by what means so may opinions, contrary to the peace of mankind, upon weak and false principles, have nevertheless been so deeply rooted in them. I mean those which I have in the precedent chapter specified, as that men shall judge of what is lawful and unlawful, not by the law itself, but by their own private judgments. That subjects sin in obeying the commands of the commonwealth, unless they themselves have first judged them to be lawful. That their propriety in their riches is such, as to exclude the dominion, which the commonwealth hath over the same, that it is lawful for subjects to kill such, 
as they call tyrants. That the sovereign power may be divided, and the like, which come to be instilled into the people by this means. They whom necessity or covetousness keepeth a tent on their trades and labor. And they, on the other side, whom superfluity or sloth carrieth after their sensual pleasures, which two sorts of men take up the greatest part of mankind. Being diverted from the deep meditation, which the learning of truth, not only in the matter of natural justice, but also of all other sciences necessarily requireth. Receive the notions of their duty, chiefly from divines in the pulpit, and partly from such of their neighbors, or familiar acquaintance, as having the faculty of discoursing readily and plausibly. Seem wiser and better learned in cases of law and conscience than themselves. And the divines, and such others as make shew of learning, derive their knowledge from the universities and from the schools of law, or from the books which by men eminent in those schools. And universities have been published. It is therefore manifest that the instruction of the people dependeth wholly on the right teaching of youth in the universities. But are not, may some men say, the universities of England learned enough already to do that? Or is it you will undertake to teach the universities? Hard questions. Yet to the first, I doubt not to answer. That till towards the later end of Henry VIII, the power of the Pope was always upheld against the power of the commonwealth, principally by the universities. And that the doctrines maintained by so many preachers against the sovereign power of the king, and by so many lawyers and others that had their education there, is a sufficient argument. That though the universities were not authors of those false doctrines, yet they knew not how to plant the true. For in such a contradiction of opinions, it is most certain that they have not been sufficiently instructed. And tis no wonder, if they yet retain a relish of that subtle liquor, wherewith they were first seasoned, against the civil authority. But to the later question, it is not fit, nor needful for me to say either I, or no, for any man that sees what I am doing, may easily perceive what I think. The safety of the people, requireth further, from him, or them that have the sovereign power, that justice be equally administered to all degrees of people. That is, that as well the rich, and mighty, as poor and obscure persons may be righted of the injuries done them. So as the great may have no greater hope of impunity when they do violence, dishonor, or any injury to the meaner sort than when one of these does the like to one of them. For in this consisteth equity, to which, as being a precept of the law of nature, a sovereign is as much subject as any of the meanest of his people. All breaches of the law are offenses against the commonwealth, but there be some, that are also against private persons. Those that concern the commonwealth only may without breach of equity be pardoned, for every man may pardon what is done against himself, according to his own discretion. But an offense against a private man cannot in equity be pardoned without the consent of him that is injured or reasonable satisfaction. The inequality of subjects proceedeth from the acts of sovereign power and therefore has no more place in the presence of the sovereign. That is to say, in a court of justice, then the inequality between kings and their subjects in the presence of the king of kings. The honor of great persons is to be valued for their beneficence and the aids they give to men of inferior rank are not at all. And the violences, oppressions, and injuries they do are not extenuated, but aggravated by the greatness of their persons, because they have least need to commit them. The consequences of this partiality towards the great proceed in this manner. Impunity mocketh insolence, insolence hatred, and hatred, and endeavor to pull down all oppressing and contumelious greatness, though with the ruin of the commonwealth. Equal taxes. To equal justice appertaineth also the equal imposition of taxes. The equality whereof dependeth not on the equality of riches, but on the equality of the debt that every man oweth to the commonwealth for his defense. It is not enough for a man to labor for the maintenance of his life, but also to fight if need be, for the securing of his labor. They must either do as the Jews did after their return from captivity, in re-edifying the temple, build with one hand, and hold the sword in the other. Or else they must hire others to fight for them. For the impositions that are laid on the people by the sovereign power, are nothing else but the wages due to them that hold the public sword. To defend private men in the exercise of several trades and callings. Seeing then the benefit that every one receiveth thereby is the enjoyment of life, which is equally dear to poor and rich. 
The debt which a poor man oweth him that defend his life is the same which a rich man oweth for the defense of his. Saving that the rich, who have the service of the poor, may be debtors not only for their own persons, but for many more. Which considered, the equality of imposition consisteth rather in the equality of that which is consumed than of the riches of the persons that consume the same. For what reason is there that he which laboreth much, and sparing the fruits of his labor, consumeth little, should be more charged, than he that living idly, getteth little? And spendeth all he gets, seeing the one hath no more protection from the commonwealth, than the other? But when the impositions are laid upon those things which men consume, every man payeth equally for what he useth, nor is the commonwealth defrauded, by the luxurious waste of private men. Public Charity and whereas many men, by accident inevitable, become unable to maintain themselves by their labor, they ought not to be left to the charity of private persons. But to be provided for, as far forth as the necessities of nature require, by the laws of the commonwealth. For as it is uncharitableness in any man, to neglect the impotent, so it is in the sovereign of a commonwealth, to expose them to the hazard of such uncertain charity. Prevention of idleness. But for such as have strong bodies, the case is otherwise, they are to be forced to work. And to avoid the excuse of not finding employment, there ought to be such laws, as may encourage all manner of arts. As navigation, agriculture, fishing, and all manner of manufacture that requires labor. The multitude of poor, and yet strong people still increasing, they are to be transplanted into countries not sufficiently inhabited. Where nevertheless, they are not to exterminate those they find there but constrain them to inhabit closer together, and not range a great deal of ground, to snatch what they find. But to court each little plot with art and labor, to give them their sustenance in due season. And when all the world is overcharged with inhabitants, then the last remedy of all is war, which provideth for every man, by victory or death. Good law is what? To the care of the sovereign, belongeth the making of good laws. But what is a good law? By a good law. I mean not a just law, for no law can be unjust. The law is made by the sovereign power, and all that is done by such power, is warranted, and owned by every one of the people, and that which every man will have so, no man can say is unjust. It is in the laws of a commonwealth, as in the laws of gaming, whatsoever the gamesters all agree on, is injustice to none of them. A good law is that, which is needful, for the good of the people, and withal perspicuous. Such as are necessary. For the use of laws, which are but rules authorized, is not to bind the people from all voluntary actions, but to direct and keep them in such a motion as not to hurt themselves by their own impetuous desires, rashness, or indiscretion, as hedges are set, not to stop travelers, but to keep them in the way. And therefore a law that is not needful, having not the true end of a law, is not good. A law may be conceived to be good, when it is for the benefit of the sovereign though it be not necessary for the people, but it is not so. For the good of the sovereign and people cannot be separated. It is a weak sovereign that has weak subjects, and a weak people, whose sovereign wanteth power to rule them at his will. Unnecessary laws are not good laws, but traps for money, which where the right of sovereign power is acknowledged, are superfluous. And where it is not acknowledged, unsufficient to defend the people. Such as are perspicuous. The perspicuity consisteth not so much in the words of the law itself, as in a declaration of the causes and motives for which it was made. That is it, that shews us the meaning of the legislator, and the meaning of the legislator known, the law is more easily understood by few, than many words. For all words, are subject to ambiguity. And therefore multiplication of words in the body of the law, is multiplication of ambiguity. Besides it seems to imply, by too much diligence, that whosoever can evade the words is without the compass say of the law. And this is a cause of many unnecessary processes. For what I consider how short were the laws of antient times, and how they grew by degrees still longer, methinks I see a contention between the pinners and pleaders of the law. The former seeking to circumscribe the later, and the later to evade their circumscriptions, and that the pleaders have got the victory. It belongeth therefore to the office of a legislator, such as is in all commonwealths the supreme representative, be it one man, or an assembly, to make the reason perspicuous. Why the law was made, and the body of the law itself, as short, 
but in as proper and significant terms as may be. Punishments. It belongeth also to the office of the sovereign to make a right application of punishments and rewards. And seeing the end of punishing is not revenge and discharge of collar, but correction either of the offender or of others by his example. The severest punishments are to be inflicted for those crimes that are of most danger to the public, such as are those which proceed from malice to the government established. Those that spring from contempt of justice, those that provoke indignation in the multitude. And those which unpunished seem authorized, as when they are committed by sons, servants, or favorites of men in authority. For indignation carrieth men, not only against the actors and authors of injustice, but against all power that is likely to protect them, as in the case of Tarquin. When for the insolent act of one of his sons, he was driven out of Rome, and the monarchy itself dissolved. But crimes of infirmity, such as are those which proceed from great provocation, from great fear, great need, or from ignorance whether the fact be a great crime or not, there is place many times for lenity. Without prejudice to the commonwealth, and lenity when there is such place for it, is required by the law of nature. The punishment of the leaders and teachers in a commotion, not the poor seduced people, when they are punished, can profit the commonwealth by their example. To be severe to the people is to punish that ignorance, which may in great part be imputed to the sovereign, whose fault it was, they were no better instructed. Rewards In like manner it belongeth to the office and duty of the sovereign, to apply his rewards always so, as there may arise from them benefit to the commonwealth. Wherein consisteth their use and end. And is then done, when they that have well served the commonwealth are with as little expense of the common treasure as is possible, so well recompensed as others thereby may be encouraged. Both to serve the same as faithfully as they can, and to study the arts by which they may be enabled to do it better. To buy with money or preferment from a popular ambitious subject, to be quiet, and desist from making ill impressions in the mindies of the people has nothing of the nature of reward. Which is ordained not for disservice, but for service past winky face nor a signa of gratitude, but of fear, nor does it tend to the benefit, but to the damage of the public. It is a contention with ambition, like that of Hercules with the monster Hydra, which having many heads, for every one that was vanquished, there grew up three. For in like manner, when the stubbornness of one popular man is overcome with reward, there arise many more, by the example, that do the same mischief in hope of like benefit. And as all sorts of manufacture, so also malice increaseth by being vendible. And though sometimes a civil war may be differed by such ways as that, yet the danger grows still the greater, and the public ruin more assured. It is therefore against the duty of the sovereign, to whom the public safety is committed, to reward those that aspire to greatness by disturbing the peace of their country, and not rather to oppose the beginnings of such men with a little danger, than after a longer time with greater. Counselors Another business of the sovereign is to choose good counselors, I mean such, whose advice he is to take in the government of the commonwealth. For this word counsel, concilium, corrupted from concidium, is a large signification, and comprehendeth all assemblies of men that sit together, not only to deliberate what is to be done hereafter, but also to judge of facts past, and of law for the present. I take it here in the first sense only. And in this sense, there is no choice of counsel, neither in a democracy nor aristocracy. Because the persons counseling are members of the person counseled. The choice of counselors, therefore, is to monarchy. In which, the sovereign that endeavoreth not to make choice of those, that in every kind are the most able, dischargeth not his office as he ought to do. The most able counselors are they that have least hope of benefit by giving evil counsel and most knowledge of those things that conduce to the peace in defense of the commonwealth. It is a hard matter to know who expecteth benefit from public troubles. But the signas that guide to a just suspicion is the soothing of the people in their unreasonable or irremediable grievances. By men whose estates are not sufficient to discharge their accustomed expenses, and may easily be observed by any one whom it concerns to know it. But to know who has most knowledge of the public affairs is yet harder, and they that know them need them a great deal the less. For to know, who knows the rules almost of any art, is a great degree of the knowledge of the same art. Because no man can be assured of the truth of another's rules, but he that is first taught to understand them. 
But the best signs of knowledge of any art are much conversing in it and constant good effects of it. Good counsel comes not by lot, nor by inheritance. And therefore there is no more reason to expect good advice from the rich or noble in matter of state than in delineating the dimensions of a fortress. Unless we shall think there needs no method in the study of the politics, as there does in the study of geometry, but only to be lookers on, which is not so. For the politics is the harder study of the two. Whereas in these parts of Europe, it hath been taken for a right of certain persons to have place in the highest council of state by inheritance. It is derived from the conquest of the Antine Germans. Wherein many absolute lords joining together to conquer other nations would not enter into the confederacy without such privileges as might be marks of difference in time following. Between their posterity and the posterity of their subjects, which privileges being inconsistent with the sovereign power, by the favor of the sovereign, they may seem to keep. But contending for them is their right, they must it is derived from the conquest of the Antine Germans. Wherein many absolute lords joining together to conquer other nations would not enter into the confederacy without such privileges as might be marks of difference in time following. Between their posterity and the posterity of their subjects, which privileges being inconsistent with the sovereign power, by the favor of the sovereign, they may seem to keep. But contending for them is their right, they must needs by degrees let them go and have at last no further honor than it heareth naturally to their abilities. And how able soever be the counselors in any affair, the benefit of their counsel is greater when they give every one his advice and reasons of it apart than when they do it in an assembly. By way of orations, and when they have premeditated, than when they speak on the sudden, both because they have more time to survey the consequences of action, and are less subject to be carried away to contradiction through envy, emulation, or other passions arising from the difference of opinion. The best counsel in those things that concern not other nations, but only the ease and benefit the subjects may enjoy by laws that look only inward, is to be taken from the general informations and complaints of the people of each province, who are best acquainted with their own wants and not therefore. When they demand nothing in derogation of the essential rights of sovereignty, to be diligently taken notice of. For without those essential rights, as I have often before said, the commonwealth cannot at all subsist. Commanders A commander of an army in chief, if he be not popular, shall not be beloved, nor feared as he ought to be by his army, and consequently cannot perform that office with good success. He must therefore be industrious, valiant, affable, liberal and fortunate, that he may gain an opinion both of sufficiency and of loving his soldiers. This is popularity and breeds in the soldiers both desire and courage to recommend themselves to his favor and protects the severity of the general in punishing when need is the mutinous or negligent soldiers. But this love of soldiers, if caution be not given of the commander's fidelity, is a dangerous thing to sovereign power, especially when it is in the hands of an assembly not popular. It belongeth therefore to the safety of the people, both that they be good conductors and faithful subjects to whom the sovereign commits his armies. But when the sovereign himself is popular, that is, reverenced and beloved of his people, there is no danger at all from the popularity of a subject. For soldiers are never so generally unjust as to side with their captain, though they love him, against their sovereign, when they love not only his person, but also his cause. And therefore those who by violence have at any time suppressed the power of their lawful sovereign, before they could settle themselves in his place, have been always put to the trouble of contriving their titles, to save the people from the shame of receiving them. To have a known right to sovereign power is so popular a quality as he that has it needs no more, for his own part, to turn the hearts of his subjects to him. But that they see him able absolutely to govern his own family, nor, on the part of his enemies, but a disbanding of their armies. For the greatest and most active part of mankind has never hitherto been well contented with the present, Concerning the offices of one sovereign to another, which are comprehended in that law, which is commonly called the law of nations, I need not say anything in this place. Because the law of nations and the law of nature is the same thing. And every sovereign hath the same right in procuring the safety of his people that any particular man can have in procuring the safety of his own body. 
and the same law that dictateth to men that have no civil government what they ought to do, and what to avoid in regard of one another, dictateth the same to commonwealths, that is, to the consciences of sovereign princes and sovereign assemblies, there being no court of natural justice, but in the conscience onely, were not man, but God reigneth. Whose laws, such of them as oblige all mankind, in respect of God, as he is the author of nature, are natural, and in respect of the same God, as he is king of kings, are laws. But of the kingdom of God, as king of kings, and as king also of a peculiar people, I shall speak in the rest of this discourse. For more audiobook like this, hit the subscribe button and click on the notification bell so you get notified when we post a new audiobook. Thanks for listening.